Hi, I'm uh, Gavin Giovanoni. I'm the Professor of Neurology at Barts in the London School of Medicine and Dentistry and I would just like to give you an overview of a talk I gave last week about the holistic management of multiple sclerosis and why we have to go beyond what our current disease modifying therapies offer for people with multiple sclerosis. It's important to point out that we kind of adopted this concept of treating to a therapeutic target from the rheumatologists who treat rheumatoid arthritis. In other words, we would want to suppress inflammation uh, as much as possible with the thinking that by having inflammation in the brains of people with multiple sclerosis that was causing all of their problems and all the damage. And if you could stop the inflammation, you would prevent people with MS uh, getting worse. When we first got our injectable uh, therapies, that's interferon beta and glutarium acetate, we were just targeting relapses. In other words, reducing the frequency of uh, attacks. Uh, they did it by about a third, uh, and maybe severe attacks by about a half. When I say severe attacks, that's meaning relapses needing uh, high dose steroids or hospital admission. Um, but we weren't at that stage going beyond that because we didn't really have treatments that could make people uh, completely relapse free. Uh, it's only when we got more effective therapies then we started saying well can't we just stop this inflammation completely and um, render them free of activity. Now we initially called this need and no evident disease activity and we concluded disease worsening. In other words uh, stable EDSS disability score. But uh, we now realize that that doesn't really happen and what drives worsening disability in the absence of relapses and uh, new lesions on MRI scan are probably different processes and they're not necessarily modifiable by our current therapies. And so I prefer to use the term no evident inflammatory disease activity targeting mainly relapses, unreported relapses and focal MRI activity. And we are going to be going beyond this and I'll provide you with the argument why we need to target the end organ in other words, prevent brain volume loss and also have some biomarkers, things that we can measure um, in addition to just uh, new lesions on MRI scan. So this is a slide that tries to capture everything we do with MS in one slide. As you can see, as you can see on the uh, left of the slide, we have disease activity, and this is defined really by the licensing of the therapies. So we can't treat inactive MS, so we have to treat active disease, and there are different categories of activity based on how bad the relapses are, how frequent they are, and how active the scans are. So we have highly active and rapidly evolving severe. We also have obviously prognostic profiling. You know, some people have a better prognostic profile than others, and we often use this to try and help us make a decision about which therapeutic strategy it is. And we have the three approaches, the old conventional step care approach where we weren't very proactive in terms of monitoring, uh, it included watchful waiting and include, included cycling of therapies on one level. Nowadays, we really offer our patients, at least in our center, the option of rapid escalation. They can choose a platform, first line therapy that tend on average to be less effective. And if they break through by having relapses or MRI activity, we escalate them quite rapidly and we don't cycle on one level. We tend to move up quite quickly. Uh, versus stopping the pyramid where we actually offer high efficacy therapies first line and to be honest with you um, we've moved over the last five years where we're now offering our the majority of our patients are choosing a high efficacy therapy first line and we're not the only ones um, and I'm beginning to see a, a slow adoption across the world of this uh, where we now have good data showing you that the more effective therapies you go on to the better you do and this is just an example of one data set. This comes from Brescia in North Italy, where they've been collecting uh, data in a very similar way over decades. And you can see in, uh, this is uh, the probability of reaching an EDSS of six, that's needing a walking stick at 65 years of age. In the so-called pre-DMT era, you know, 80% of patients or more than 80% of patients got to 65 having had a, a stick. When we move into the epoch, the time period where we had injectable therapies, uh, the lower efficacy DMTs, that drops to about 60, 65 percent. 
And in the current epoch, which is where we have high efficacy therapies now, that's dropped to below 30%. It's about 25%. So there is no doubt that we are having a major impact uh, on the uh, natural history of the disease. In other words, we're preventing disability. Another factor that's not captured in the Italian data is time to diagnosis and time to treatment. So what's also improved is our diagnostic speed and also getting people onto therapy earlier. And this is just data from Sweden. I'm not sure if you're aware, but in Sweden, everybody who is who has MS is almost on a, on a, on a, a national register. And so they can track the whole country. And so this is really good data. And it shows you that when you look at um, disability progression or worsening, people who get onto their therapy within the first year do so much better than people who have delayed access one to three years before going on to a treatment or even more than three years. And this is time to EDSS4. Um, this is not a walking stick. This is when MS begins to affect your mobility. Uh, this is actually a surrogate. We think this is a good, a good um, representation of secondary progressive disease. So you can see by getting onto therapy very, very quickly, um, it reduces your risk. You know, 90% of these people um, are surviving. So only 10% after 200 months of follow-up uh, uh, have secondary progressive disease or EDSS4. Whereas if you wait more than three years to going on to therapy, that drops down to about 70%. So there's a big gap here uh, in terms of access to treatment. This is now data from the MS base, which is the international uh, registry that's run out of Melbourne, Australia, just showing you that access to high efficacy therapies very early. So this is the blue line versus a late access makes an enormous difference in terms of worsening disability. Um, the daylight, yeah, the whiteness between these two curves is quite large. And when you have delayed access, so this is from six years after disease onset, that uh, daylight disappears. So it's quite clear from the uh, data that uh, early access to highly effective therapies, okay, so these are treatments like in this database, um, the way it's done is mainly fingolimod, nadalizumab, alimtuzumab, you know, doesn't include uh, the more recently licensed uh, treatments. But the bottom line is, on average, if you go into a high efficacy therapy first line or early, you do so much better if you have delayed access to a high efficacy therapy. And the effectiveness of these treatments drops with time. And so this is one of the reasons why we have this uh, approach where we would like people to manage MS the same way a neurologist manage stroke or brain attack. Uh, and time really is brain. And we're trying to shift people into thinking like stroke doctors. We shouldn't waste time in terms of treating. And this is one of the reasons why um, we put together this international policy initiative, which was published in 2015. So it's seven years old. We need to update it. Uh, and when we actually sat down at the table and asked the question, what should our uh, treatment objective be? And we, re we really begin to think it's not about the now, it's about the future. And we know that what protects people from getting old or suffering from um, age-related cognitive impairment, for example, is how well or healthy your brain is in old age. And so this is why we try to set the treatment objective to maximize the lifelong brain health of every person with MS. So we try to encourage uh, neurologists and MS experts to think about the future and how do we get people with multiple sclerosis to old age with a healthy brain so they can deal with uh, 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 the ravages of aging. And the whole purpose of this document was really to speed up um, the diagnostic and treatment pathways for people with the disease. I'd urge you to read this document if you haven't. It's written in very lay English in the sense that it's not very scientific. It doesn't refer to any specific disease modifying treatments. So it's not there to advertise drug X or drug Y. It's about a principle of how we should be managing MS in the current uh, environment. The strategy is very simple. What we're trying to do is uh, change the trajectory of the disease. And the question is, uh, if we start earlier versus later, we will obviously, on average, uh, allow people to get to older ages with less disability, which I've shown you is happening already. But a lot of people are still getting to old age with disability. And so the question we have to ask ourselves can we do better? And I think we can do better. 
Um, this is one trial we're about to start uh, in the UK where we actually want to test whether or not um, starting a high-efficacy therapy just three months or 12 weeks earlier makes a difference. So what you've got to realize is when somebody presents with their first clinical attack or their first symptoms, they don't get diagnosed for several weeks and they don't get onto a treatment for several months. Uh, the average time to get onto a treatment is usually between uh, two to four months. Uh, and so what we're doing is we're going to take people who present with a first clinical attack suggestive of multiple sclerosis, okay, and we're going to randomize them to starting on a drug called natalizumab or Tysabri, um, with or without steroids, with steroids compared to uh, placebo. And then everybody after, the, then the placebo arm will all get onto active treatment at uh, uh, week 12. So there's this very early access versus early, early access. And we think we've got equipoise. We think this is ethical because this is kind of what happens now normally in clinical practice. People take about 12 months, uh, 12 weeks to get onto a treatment. And we're going to see if there's a difference between uh, early, very early access versus early access to treatment of a high efficacy therapy. So we're beginning to think like stroke doctors. Let's get people onto treatment now rather than next week or the month after. To be honest with you, we have been practicing this uh, in some patients already, particularly ones who have a very poor prognostic profile at baseline. We try and get them onto treatment as quickly as possible, uh, just in case they have another attack or another relapse uh, that leaves them with a disability. <clears throat> so this is one of my patients um, who's given me permission to discuss her case. So she is very well educated and she actually had quite bad multiple sclerosis and failed the acetate and injectable therapy quite early on. And we started her on alemtuzumab and unfortunately she failed alemtuzumab uh, and had a breakthrough attack, which we detected in interestingly using our spinal fluid neurofilament assay. Anyway, she then uh, was offered uh, hemopoietic stem cell transplant, but she turned that down because she wanted to start a family and she didn't have the, uh, she didn't like the risk of infertility or early menopause as a result of HSCT. So we put on natalizumab and she's, she did very well on natalizumab. Essentially, she remained, uh, her EDSS improved slightly, disability improved because she made a recovery from relapses. And despite being stable, uh, she has noticed some deterioration in her upper limb function. Um, <clears throat> Uh, and her MRI of her spine uh, showed that the lesion that caused the, that was there in the 2014 uh, reduced in size, but she has got a spinal cord atrophy or shrinkage of the spinal cord, which happens after in MS. You know, the uh, processes that result in the damaged nerve fibers being removed it causes uh, accelerated volume loss, brain and spinal cord. And, you know, although this lady is na uh, na na naida, no evident inflammatory disease activity, she's clearly not stable. She's getting worse. You know, her nine-hole pec test uh, had deteriorated by four seconds, for example. So why is this patient getting MS? Uh, and this is uh, now very common uh, in all populations of MS patients we look at. And we now call this, uh, in relapsing patients, PIRA, Progression Independent Relapse Activity. And this is uh, data from over 5,500 patients who participated in the Tysabri observational program in Europe, mainly in Europe. Uh, and these people were on natalizumab. They almost all go, I mean, 80% of these patients are relapse-free. Uh, so they're not having ongoing relapses because they're on a very effective therapy. But you can see that about, 37% of them over about five years will worsen. They will get worsening disability despite being attack-free. And we now know that about two-thirds of these worsenings, this disability worsening, uh, is occurring in people that are not having relapses. So it's what we call relapse unassociated. Um, so this is uh, very worrying that there's something happening underneath people having inflammatory events, relapses or MRI activity. And although this is called Pira, I prefer using the term uh, smoldering MS. I'll come back to why I prefer the use of smoldering MS. Anyway, this is now the similar analysis uh, to the previous uh, uh, natalizumab data set from the uh, uh, OPERA 1, OPERA 2. This was the phase 3 ocrelizumab versus Rebif trial, interferon beta trial. And even in that trial, you can see people on rebirth, about 80%, 78% of the worsenings that occurred, progressions, were occurring in people uh, that weren't having relapses or independent of relapse activity. Uh, 
And when it goes to ocrelizumab, which is more effective at suppressing relapses, almost 90% of worsenings were not what not linked to relapses. You know, I mean, in this study, only 12% or 3% of worsenings were associated with a relapse. What I mean by that is you have a relapse, you get cause you to become a little bit disabled and you have failure to recover from relapse. And so that's what we would call relapse associated worsening. So in the modern environment now, when people are on very effective therapies, most of the progression or worsening disability is occurring independent of uh, inflammatory activity. So these people are rendered free of activity, but they're still getting worse. And I like the term smoldering MS because it captures <clears throat> that even though we're not seeing acute new lesions from forming, or and we are seeing behind the, the focal inflammatory lesions something else happening, something smoldering away uh, in the brains of people with multiple sclerosis, causing them to get worse. And we know that this process is there from the beginning because when we look at Mm -hmm. what I call brain volume loss or brain atrophy. And we know that people with multiple sclerosis, their brains shrink much quicker than normal. I mean, sadly, uh, age, uh, aging is a disease in the sense that from about 35 years of age, we all lose brain volume. Um, but with, in multiple sclerosis, that occurs at a, a rate that's double to even seven times higher than the, the normal population. And when you actually measure brain volume loss, um, the average person will lose brain of about 0.1 to 1.1 two percent per annum and in MS patients yeah it's about 0.5 per annum and it occurs at all stages of the disease so yeah we have people with first attack clinical isolated syndrome relapsing remitting MS secondary progressive MS or primary progressive MS so it's a um, I think that's happening all the time and we can even add another box so this is data from Italy looking at radiologically isolated syndrome or asymptomatic MS so these people have the disease before, I mean, they got MS before they have any symptoms. We pick it up by doing MRI scans for another reason. You know, maybe they've had a headache or a head injury or something like that. And you can see they're also losing um, uh, uh, brain volume. And I like this brain volume data because the, the brain volume is what I call the end organ and it integrates, it's, it's, it's a marker of the accumulation of damage over time. Um, and now the reason why these people yet are not called progressive MS because they have spare capacity, they have reserve or resilience which compensates for the damage. And only when they get to a threshold uh, and they've lost that resilience do they start getting clinically apparent or avert uh, worsening. <laughs> Another thing is this term active inactive MS and uh, this may this particular study uh, tells you that the majority of people, okay who come to the end of their life still have active ongoing inflammation in their brains with ms and this is the largest post-mortem study from the amsterdam brain bank from the netherlands and this is 182 people with multiple sclerosis the majority of these patients died because they had um, secondary or primary progressive disease and the mean disease duration was 29 years and they looked at over seven and a half thousand lesions and you can see that um, uh, or 60%, 57% of these lesions were inflamed at active inflammation. And that meant 78% of cases had uh, active lesions. So, you know, even, if, even though people with multiple sclerosis, as they have, uh, as they get older, as they move into the progressive phases or the more advanced disease, they stop having relapses and MRI activity, but that doesn't mean to say they don't have ongoing inflammation and the inflammation is still there, which means we still have to target the inflammation. That inflammation may be slightly different in that it's not that, uh, we think it's not driven by um, the periphery. That's one theory. Uh, and it's due to what we call smoldering inflammation within the brain and spinal cord. But that still means we need to tackle it with uh, anti-inflammatory drugs. Anyway, there are a lot of other factors now that we think drive the so-called smoldering MS. Uh, and when you look in the, the uh, brains of people with multiple sclerosis, that may be persistent demyelination. It's the so-called hot microglia, these cells uh, within the, they call innate cells. Um, they come from the same population of cells and make a white blood cell called the monocyte. These are activated and you can detect them using very special imaging, a light up. Um, also, the inflammation that occurs in the covering of the brain, the so-called meninges, uh, we think this is driven by B cells that make antibodies and plasma cells that also make antibodies. 
obviously there's a, a, a theory that iron, which is a pro-inflammatory molecule uh, and stimulates ongoing damage in lesions is increased. Obviously, when you've demyelinated or have a, uh, a reduced uh, an inflammation going on, these nerve fibers have to fire more frequently. They use more energy, and that energy deficit may also drive worsening. And then there's also this theory that uh, endogenous viruses, be it Epstein-Barr virus or maybe herbs, endogenous retroviruses, may be driving inflammation in the brains of people with more advanced disease. So there are lots of reasons um, that we need to tackle MS with other therapies. You know, for example, antivirals or drugs to treat or to, or to block these other processes. One of the ones that we are testing in our own center is we now know that um, the so-called central nervous system B and plasma cell uh, response is probably bad for you. It probably drives at least the cortical lesions, and it may even drive so-called slowly expanding lesions. And we would we have to basically scrub the central nervous system uh, clean of uh, antibodies and plasma uh, plasma cells and B cells. We know from our UK brain bank uh, study that people who have MS and come to post-mortem, those that are follicle positive, in other words, have evidence of these follicles in the coverings of the brain, um, have a much more malignant uh, MS course than people who don't have follicles. So there's lots of circumstantial evidence that within the brains of people with MS, having these B and plasma cell immune responses is not good for you, and we need to uh, scrub those clean. Now, our current therapies aren't doing that. <clears throat> Just to say to you that uh, we now know that you can actually measure these lesions using special MRI scans, these so-called follicles, where these little B cell clusters are, and they link to the so-called cortical MS lesion, these long lesions in the, in, the, in the cortex of the brain of people with multiple sclerosis. And these lesions are associated with uh, more atrophy, more loss of brain volume, and worse outcome. So there is a body of evidence building uh, that we have to target the uh, these follicle-like structures in the brains of people with multiple sclerosis. Now, my colleague and I, David Baker, we wrote a review article um, three years ago um, discussing all the therapies that are available to target um, uh, B cells and plasma cells, and particularly those that are going into the central nervous system. And we are involved in a few trials at the moment, uh, specifically targeting these processes. And uh, one of them is cladribine. We know cladribine is licensed. Its uh, trade name is called Mavenclad. It penetrates the central nervous system. And we find about 25% of the levels in the spinal fluid, as you find in the blood. And that may be sufficient to help target uh, these B cells within the brain and spinal cord. And we've got two studies going on where we're looking at whether or not cladribine can clear the central nervous system of B cells. And I'll come back to that because we think uh, there is data out there suggesting it does. Then there's a new class of drugs called Bruton tyrosine kinase inhibitors or BTK inhibitors. And there are uh, five and maybe a sixth and seventh going into trial in, in multiple sclerosis. And these are CNS penetrant. They go into the brains of people with multiple sclerosis and they inhibit B cells. Uh, and they may also uh, target another another cell called the microglia, uh, the hot microglia as well. And so this may be a dual action molecule that may help with um, uh, may help with smoldering MS. And then there's this group of drugs called proteasome inhibitors. So these are um, therapies that are used to treat a condition called myeloma, which is a malignant cell of uh, plasma cell. And we are testing uh, in our center a second generation exosomid in a trial called the Sizemus trial. And this is a, um, a very simple study looking mainly at safety, both in relapsing and progressive patients, to see if by giving people two years of exosomid treatment, we can actually clear the brain of oligoclonal bands, immunoglobulins, uh, and see if we can scrub the brain clean of those uh, uh, plasma plasma cells and B cells, which make uh, MS worse. So this is actually a study from Poland. Uh, a colleague of mine, Conrad Rechdak, did a trial. Well, uh, they've been using cladribine in Poland for decades. And they've been using the intravenous formulation. And they called back a group of patients that had been given cladribine 10 or more years ago. 
and, and, and got them to agree to have lumbar punctures. And they found that about half of them had lost the oligoclonal bands, the so-called immunoglobulin bands in their spinal fluid. And if they had lost their bands, they tended to be stable compared to those who hadn't lost their bands that got worse uh, over the 10-year period. And I think this is a, you know, uh, one study, but this is why we are doing two studies in our center, uh, looking at uh, cladribine, both the oral formulation and the, and the um, subcutaneous formulation to see whether or not it gets into the uh, brain uh, and clears the brain or reduces the production of immunoglobulins in the, in the spinal fluid. So this is an exciting time, you know, we began, and this is an example of us going beyond just targeting the processes that we think drive relapses and MRI activity, new lesions, and going beyond to try and target some of these processes that we think are driving smoldering MS. This is just showing you the PET scans um, of people using this, bio, my, this TS, so it's called TSBO PET. So this is actually a, a marker for microglia, uh, activated microglia, and you can see both in the relapsing and the secondary progressive uh, patients, we find uh, um, uh, these hot microglia. Uh, and the more disease you've got, in other words, this is looking at a clinical isolated syndrome population, but those that have dissemination in time and space, in other words, become MS, have got much higher levels of this particular binding than those that don't convert to MS. Um, and similarly, uh, people with more advanced disease, be it primary or secondary progressive disease, you know, have a much hot much hotter brain when it comes to uh, microglial activation than people with uh, early disease. So this is a another target um, uh, that, that we will be targeting uh, in MS. Another thing is that all lesions are made equal. So there's a particular lesion um, that's now known as the slowly expanding lesion. So when you actually do a, a scan called the T1 scan, okay, um, you can or you use a special sequence. Um, you can find these lesions expanding over time. Uh, and these lesions are called slowly expanding lesions, and we now know that they're not good for you. We know people who have slowly expanding lesions or increase the number do much worse than those who don't have slowly expanding lesions and don't increase their numbers. So this is a really important therapeutic target, and our current treatments are pretty ineffective uh, at stopping these lesions getting larger. Some of our anti-inflammatory therapies have a small effect on these lesions. They tend to be the highly effective therapies. But overall, the slowly expanding lesions that are already there continue to get bigger. And obviously, as they get bigger, they damage the brain and spinal cord around them. This is just showing you that uh, this is from uh, the ocrelizumab relapsing and primary progressive trials, just showing you that the number and volume, the size of these lesions is, although higher in primary progressive disease than relapsing, it's still there. And the difference is not that great. And this is a study from Canada in people with radiologically isolated syndrome, uh, looking at these rim lesions where they've got iron around them. Uh, and they found that this pathology is there from the very beginning. So 61% of this uh, population of 28 patients with radiologically isolated syndrome had uh, so-called rim lesions, which are more likely to become slowly expanding. So this pathology is there from the beginning of the disease. So this is hot data from the American Academy of Neurology that was presented by Doug Arnold, who's a radio, he's a neurologist who runs a image analysis company in, in Montreal. Um, and he presented some of the uh, data on one of the BTK inhibitors, Evabrutinib. Um, and as we know, either brutinib inhibits B cells and macrophages in the periphery, but it also gets into the CNS and the central nervous system effects. And I think the important thing uh, from the phase two data that had different doses is that the high dose of either brutinib uh, uh, reduced the increase in slowly expanding lesion volume. So this is really exciting. So now we have a, uh, a treatment, or the promise of a treatment, either brutinib, which is the first uh, into MS uh, from that class of therapies, um, having an impact on slowly expanding lesions. Now, whether this is due to its impact via the B cell or inhibiting the microglia is debatable, possibly both. But the good news is for the first time, um, we've got a hint that some of our new therapies going forward uh, are targeting one of the processes that's driving smoldering MS.
Another thing is so-called add-on neuroprotection. So we in our group uh, and in the UK have been working on uh, add-on neuroprotective therapies for a long, long time. And we actually found that a class of treatment called sodium channel blockers uh, are able to protect damaged nerve fibers. And this is just the result of an optic neuritis trial where we used an anti-epilepsy uh, drug, uh, phenytoin. Um, it's a very old drug and we chose phenytoin because we could get loaded up High, high levels very, very quickly. And we showed that in people presenting with optic neuritis, a lesion in the optic nerve, when they get onto this drug within two weeks, okay, it reduced the loss of nerve fibers, as we measured on the retina, by 30%. So this is actually a therapeutic strategy that we've been trying to get take forward, but it's very difficult um, to do add-on studies. I don't think we as an MS community have worked out ourselves and with the regulators, that's the Fed, FDA in the United States and the European Medicine Agency and the MHRA in the UK, on how to do combination therapy trials um, properly. But anyway, I am remain determined that we will go forward with an add-on your protective drug at some stage uh, to try and protect those nerve fibers that have been damaged by inflammation, uh, which will then allow them to be remyelinated and hopefully survive and and, continue, uh, and uh, recover function. Remyelination has been disappointing. So everybody wants a remyelinating therapy. Uh, and we've had three negative uh, losses, three negative programs uh, in the last three years. High-dose biotin, uh, this thing called op 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 opisunumab, which is a monoclonal antibody, a biological therapy that's given as an infusion that inhibits an inhibitor of remyelination. Uh, and this drug called bexarotene, which is from a class of therapy that re, um, um, stimulates the cells to go from oligodendrocyte precursors into oligodendrocytes to make myelin. Uh, and we're waiting for the results of another class of drug called uh, elizanumab, which uh, binds to another inhibitor or inhibits another inhibitor of remyelination to come out. We we know the phase two trials over. We um, Those results should be available uh, by the end of the year, hopefully at Ectrans, which is our big MS meeting. It's going to happen in Amsterdam in October. <clears throat> so one of the things I think that may be wrong with our trials is not so much that we've got the wrong therapeutic strategies. I think these molecules all have a compelling reason why we should be testing them in MS. But one of the things we haven't included is active add-on rehabilitation or exercise. And we know the best stimulus for recovery of function is rehabilitation. And uh, if you went to people who work in stroke or in spinal cord injury, you would never do a recovery of function trial in those other conditions without having all the patients uh, enrolled in a very active rehabilitation program. And that creates the biological or physiological stimulus for recovery of function. And there are many processes, and I'm not going to go through the signs, but the way we recover function after injury, be it from MS, demyelinating injury, or from a stroke or, or trauma, is that you either remodel, you can remodel the axons, you can sprout axons and grow one, new ones, you can create new synapses, or you can actually take over different areas of the brain to improve function. All these processes are driven by, well, exercise has been shown to drive all these processes. So yes, I think we, as an MS community, have made a big mistake by not including into our trial design exercise. And that means everybody who goes into a remyelination or neuro-restorative trial, a trial designed to restore function, should all get rehabilitation and exercise. And it probably needs to be personalized. You know, you know, one program, that's one thing about rehabilitation. You know, somebody's got a weak arm. There's no point in giving them running exercise. You need to give them exercises for their arm. If somebody's got reduced vision in their left eye, you have to give them visual exercises. If somebody's complaining of cognitive deficits, you've got to give them cognitive exercises. So this will need a targeted, personalized rehabilitation program for the individual added on at, um, across the trials. And then on top of that, you give them agents that can speed up the recovery of function. Anyway, I want to talk about the real MS. So this is quite a complicated slide. What happened is uh, people that participated in the, one of the original interferon trials, so this was the Avonex trial, um, were then followed up at 15 years to see how they did in terms of disability. And what was quite surprising that if you were, and, they, and what they did was they 
divided these patients into into quartiles uh, 20 the first 25 the next 25 the next 25 and the, the final quarter and looked at and they compared those who were the worst outcome versus the best outcome in the trial and if you are on Avonex interferon and you happen to have new lesions on your scan that's either enhancing lesions or new or new lesions on a so-called T2 scan, or you had a relapse, you were much more likely to end up in the worst outcome group compared to the best outcome group. However, if you were on placebo, not on interferon, that made no difference. And that's telling us that relapses and MRI lesions cannot be MS, because if it was MS, they should cause poor outcome in both groups. So what, the way I interpret this is, is that the inflammatory lesion is in response to what's causing MS. It's not multiple sclerosis itself, which means we have to move beyond that as a treatment target. We have to obviously suppress it, okay, because we know that if it's not suppressed, it means the ongoing process that's causing MS is ongoing. But even if you don't have these, you can still get worse because the disease process doesn't necessarily need to stimulate the immune system to make an immune response to what's causing the disease. And this is not the only data set. So this is data now from MS Base, just showing you that the on-treatment relapses predicts a poor outcome. But if you have, but off-treatment relapses made no difference uh, to outcome, okay? Uh, and so, uh, there's this thing called deductive reasoning uh, and you apply a logic it's actually medical philosophy this you apply logic and uh, apprentice put forward a criteria for when a surrogate endpoint you know be it relapses or MRI activity um, uh, for it to represent the disease it's got a uh, the baseline measurement has to be predictive of outcome and I can tell you now that baseline measurements of MRI activity and relapses only don't predict outcome except for a small window in the first two to five years. Outside of that, MRI activity and relapses don't predict a poor outcome. Yeah. Um, and change in the measurement over time predict outcome, which is not correct with uh, these two markers. And the change in the measurement by therapy has to be predictive of outcome. And as I've shown you in the slide before, not necessarily. Um, so, you know, based on deductive reasoning and uh, medical philo philosophical principles, uh, relapses and MRI activity are not MS. They probably the immune system's response to what's causing the disease, and we now have to go beyond those. Another clue to this is from a recent phase three trial. Uh, some of you may have heard of ofatumumab. This is another drug that's part of the anti-CD20 class is given by a subcutaneous injection every month versus an oral therapy called teriflunamide. It was quite clear that ofatumumab was much better than teriflunamide in suppressing relapses. There was about a 50 plus percent difference of relapses and MRI activity. There was a well over 90 percent superiority of um, ofatumumab compared to teriflunamide. But when you go on to the clinical outcomes, um, the disability progression data was very weak. Uh, only uh, compared to teriflunamide, it only just was superior. And when you go to brain volume loss, there was no difference in the rate of brain volume loss in year two, which is the window we need to look at uh, in, in, in trials. So people um, lost brain volume at a similar rate on ofatumumab and teriflunamide, telling us that when you're looking at the end organ, uh, independently of relapses and MRI activity, there's no difference between these two therapies in that particular biomarker. So this disconnect between impact on inflammation and impact on the end organ, okay, is telling us that we're not on top of multiple sclerosis by simply making people free of relapses and MRI activity. Another clue to this comes from a analysis of the um, oculizumab and anti-CD20 trial. So what you've got to realize is when we designed this trial, everybody got given the same dose of oculizumab. We gave them 600 milligrams every six months by infusion. And that means if you were 60 kilograms, you were getting 10 milligrams per kilogram, a high dose. And if you were 120 kilograms, you were only getting half that dose, five milligrams per kilogram. So built into the trial, based on body weight, essentially, is a different dose. And we know the people got the highest dose at the, the greatest B cell depletion, okay? And the highest drug levels compared to people who are larger. <clears throat> and uh, 
a surprise for us was when we actually looked at, uh, again, dividing the patients into quartiles based on their drug levels and B cell depletion data, um, there was no difference in terms of MRI activity. So people who are on the, in the first quartile versus the fourth quartile had the same suppression of new lesions on scan. Okay, gadolinium enhancing, the, act, the active new lesions or the or the T2 new new or enlarging T2 lesions. <clears throat> so this is a, the relapsing population, and the same thing was observed in the uh, primary progressive trial where the drug was compared to placebo. So looking at this, you would say, well, <clears throat> no difference. We probably don't need a high dose. The low dose is fine. And the same thing was seen on relapse rates. You can see people in the lowest quartile versus the highest quartile, there was a similar suppression of relapse activity. However, when you actually looked at disability progression, this is worsening disability, there was a clear ladder. At the top here, you see rebuff. <clears throat> okay, and now we see the quartiles. Okay, one, two, three, and four. So those people that were in the top quartile of exposure, the largest dose of ocrelizumab, okay, had the greatest suppression or worsening disability. So there's a disconnect between disability progression versus relapses and MRI activity. Okay, and the same thing was seen in the oratorio trial. Um, obviously, in primary progressive populations, the um, the worsening disability occurred in fewer patients, but you can see there is a ladder, and particularly the high dose group are much better than the lower dose, dose groups compared to placebo. And because of this, we think now that we need more, not less, ocrelizumab. And one of the reasons why we might need more is more gets into the brain. Uh, contrary to common belief, uh, antibodies do get across into the brain. About you know, 0.5% um, of what's in the periphery gets into the brain. And maybe those on higher dose ocrelizumab get more into the brain and that targets the so-called B cells uh, inside the central nervous system. And because of that, we've got uh, um, um, a trial going on now. So we talk about ceiling and floor effects. So what I'm, sa what I'm saying is that when you look at relapses and MRI activity, okay, low dose, high dose, no difference. Okay? Whereas when you look at disability progression, there's a ladder. And so what we think is that, depending how you define it, there's a ceiling or a floor effect uh, on relapse with MRI activity, uh, but disability progression still has sensitivity to dose. Uh, and because of this, we've got two studies um, uh, recruiting right now. One's called Musette in relapsing patients, and one's called Gavot, which is in the primary progressive population, uh, looking at uh, high-dose ocrelizumab versus standard dose. So we're comparing 600 with 1,200 or 1,800 milligrams based on body size to see if we can actually optimize or improve outcomes based on giving people high doses of ocrelizumab. So we need to obviously go beyond just targeting inflammation in the periphery. And so this is why I talk about the holistic management of MS. And I've alluded to in my previous talks that we need to go we need to go um, um, and target anti-inflammatory neuroprotective mechanisms, remyelination, and neurorestoration. But we also need to consider non-MS targets. Uh, you know, how do we improve brain health in general? And we call this, and so this is why I'm so uh, adamant that we've got to stop smokers from smoking. We've got to reduce alcohol consumption to healthy levels, which some people would argue is give up alcohol. I'm not so sure that's correct. Okay. Exercise. Um, at the moment, I don't know what's best, but maybe hits better than aerobic. Obviously, improving your diet. Uh, if you look in the literature, um, um, it looks like caloric restriction, intermittent fasting, and ketogenic diets are better. <clears throat> are better. Um, improving sleep hygiene. We know people who don't sleep well do worse. We've also got to target comorbidities, so um, um, prevent people from getting metabolic syndrome, that's diabetes or prediabetes. Try and prevent people getting head injuries. Uh, obviously, target infections. There is data from the MS field that people who get recurrent infections do worse than people who don't. So how do we stop people getting recurrent bladder infections, recurrent pneumonias? Things that aren't really targeted in MS are 
periodontal disease, we, 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 there's some early evidence showing that MS patients have got much worse gum disease. And that may be important in driving MS disease activity, as well as sinusitis. Obviously, concomitant medications, anticholinergics have been shown in the general population to be worse for brain health. And we give them, we often prescribe these class of drugs to people with MS. You know, just for example, amitriptyline, a tricyclic antidepressant that's used to help people sleep and used for pain, um, uh, is not good for the brain. Uh, similarly, bladder drugs, uh, anticholinergic drugs to reduce bladder irritability, particularly the old generation ones that cross the blood-brain barrier, also affect brain health. Anti-aging medications, so hormone replacement therapy in women, uh, I personally think if there are no contraindications, every woman who's postmenopausal or perimenopausal should go on to HRT. There's a debate around that, and there are trials running to see whether or not uh, it improves outcomes. Metformin, um, there's a big uh, so-called biohacking community are using metformin as anti-aging, and there is data from MS that it may promote remyelination, and there's currently trials going on in MS to test this as a remyelination agent. And then social determinants of health, uh, you know, some of these are modifiable. You know, MS is a disease that reduces your social capital. In other words, it shrinks your social network. Uh, people lose their jobs, they become socially isolated, and we know that that's bad for the brain. And so what can we do as an MS experts, for example, can we get you uh, more engaged with your your family, your friends, and can we expand your social network? So these are all things that uh, can be done. And then obviously wellness. Uh, wellness is a bit of a nebulous concept, but it's increasingly gaining traction, particularly in mental health. Uh, by improving wellness, you improve outcomes, and I think MS is no different. So this to say to you, um, around diets, all those diets I mentioned trigger this pathway called ketogenesis. So when you're not eating or you're eating or you're restricting your calories, you often have to uh, metabolize fat um, uh, and protein into these so-called ketones which your brain uses. And one of these ketone bodies is called beta-hydroxybutyrate. And we now know that this binds to a particular receptor on a cell and stimulates pathways that are pro-survival, uh, antioxidant, and they may be neuroprotective. And the reason why this is such an important uh, observation is that this particular molecule, beta hydroxybutyrate works by the same mechanism as fumarates, which is one of our therapies. So you, you may or may not have heard that a drug called Tecfidera, which is dimethyl fumarate, gets broken down into uh, fumarate, and that binds to the same receptor as one of the ketone bodies and stimulates the same pathway. So there is a thinking now is that diets, particularly ketogenic diets or low-carbohydrate diets that put up uh, these ketone bodies may be neuroprotective and modify the, the disease course. Uh, and we have a mechanism uh, how this does this. Interestingly, um, metformin works in a very similar way, not binding to that receptor, but works another way to increase the, the so-called molecule that uh, drives these processes. And there has been work um, from uh, a colleague of mine, Robin Franklin, in Cambridge and his group showing you that if you um, put people, or well, mice, uh, on metformin, this diabetic drug, or you fast these animals, it causes their oligodendrocyte precursors. These are the cells that make myelin to, to uh, become oligodendrocytes and to uh, remyelinate these animals better than older mice. And so this switch, um, um, the switch, can, it's so-called senescence switch, you switch the senescence switch off and you rejuvenate these cells, can be done with fasting, metformin, and I wouldn't be surprised if it, uh, the mechanism was driven by the ketone bodies that, are, that go with fasting. And the particular pathway, for those of you who are interested in the science, is, is this transcription factor. This is a factor that's kept in the, in the cytoplasm of cells. As soon as you stimulate this receptor, which is the uh, HCA2 receptor, uh, it causes this transcription factor to be released from its inhibitor, it goes into the brain and stimulates a whole lot of antioxidant pathways that are pro-survival. And we think that this pathway, this NRF2 pathway, is also the pathway that rejuvenates oligodendrocytes. <clears throat> now, how else? There are other ways of rejuvenating uh, this. Uh, there are some nutraceuticals. I haven't got time to go into those today that may rejuvenate NRF2. I've already mentioned metformin, fumarates, but the other one that does it is exercise. Exercise is another factor uh, 
um, that that uh, increases NRF2 expression. And so this is another reason why uh, exercise is probably anti-aging and may also help with the rejuvenation process. And I wouldn't be surprised if exercise itself uh, improves recovery of function via mechanisms that drive remyelination or restorative mechanisms. We all got very depressed when um, we announced the phase two results of the second opusunumab trial. Um, it was negative. But when we actually drilled down into the trial and we looked at those people that were on dimethyl fumarate, so this was an add-on study. So people in this trial were either interferon beta, dimethyl fumarate, or natalizumab. But the ones that are on dimethyl fumarate, there was a strong trend for improvement in outcome versus the other two drugs. And as I already said to you, dimethyl fumarate is one of the molecules that stimulates this NRF2 pathway. I suspect that it rejuvenates oligodendrocytes. And this may be why the people on dimethyl fumarate were doing better, because they were more likely to remyelinate than the other two. And so this suggests that if we're going to go ahead with clinical trials of remyelination therapies, maybe we need a platform therapy like dimethyl fumarate or, or metformin. What about exercise? So this is a paper that's just come out uh, last year showing you that when you compare uh, people having moderate continuous training, so this is aerobic exercise at a moderate level, so you put your heart rate up by maybe 60%, uh, and this is kind of what the WHO recommends, you should do 150 minutes of uh, moderate continuous training a week, ideally in five sessions of a half an hour versus high intensity interval training. So this is much more intense. So you've got to get your heart rate up to 90% uh, or higher. Um, and what's interesting is that uh, uh, people with multiple sclerosis who went on, to, who had hit, actually had a, a, a reduction in the so-called neurofilament levels in their blood, suggesting that this is anti-inflammatory. And it also uh, had a bigger impact on inflammatory markers in the peripheral blood content con com compared to uh, continuous training. So based on this and other studies, um, I personally think that if you can do HIT, it's much better in terms of the biology uh, underlying science than moderate continuous training. However, some people with multiple sclerosis simply can't do HIT because they're quite disabled, they find the increase in body temperature uh, intolerable. Uh, and so exercise is important. If you can do HIT, even better. But if you can't do HIT, please just continue with your moderate uh, exercise tra training if you can. Comorbidities. So this is work from uh, Ruth Ann Mary in Canada, just showing you that if you have multiple sclerosis and you have a so-called vascular comorbidity, so this is somebody who has high cholesterol, high blood pressure, hypertension, they are smokers, um, they have evidence of vascular disease already, be it coronary or cerebrovascular disease or peripheral vascular disease. If you have a so-called vascular comorbidity, okay, you get to using a walking stick much, much quicker. So the average year, I would say, 12 years uh, if you had a, versus 18 years if you uh, didn't have a comorbidity. So this is telling us that, you know, if we want to optimize outcomes, we should stop people getting comorbidities or, sh or we should be more aggressive at managing their comorbidities. <clears throat> this is why I stress, you know, get your lifestyle as healthy as possible and try and prevent yourself getting a comorbidity because your, it worsens your MS outcomes. And this may underlie why we've seen a treatment effect uh, with high dose simvastatin. As you know, simvastatin is a drug that's been licensed for high cholesterol. It's normally given at 20 or 40 milligrams. Uh, so my colleague Jeremy Chatterway did a trial many years ago now where they used 80 milligrams, a very high dose, and it was shown to slow down brain volume loss uh, in people with secondary progressive disease compared to placebo. And it also had an impact on worsening EDSS disability. And because of this now, we've got a phase three study running in the UK. It's fully recruited, and I think the results will be available in about a year's time, testing whether or not everybody with more advanced disease should be on high dose simvastatin. <clears throat> this may be working via comorbidities because this is a drug that's licensed for vascular, you know, to prevent vascular disease. So this may be working via vascular mechanisms. It doesn't really matter because at a population level, if we can slow down the uh, smoldering MS processes by targeting vascular comorbidities with simvastatin, 
that's a plus because it'll improve outcomes over time. So to conclude then, and I want to give you this slide. So this is the uh, uh, team, G team GB, the British cycling team at the Olympic Games. And you can see they were reasonably poor. I mean, going back to 1992, okay, they took one gold medal. In 96, they took two bronzes. 2000, they took six medals. And what happened in 1997, they um, uh, hired a consultant who later in 2003 became their permanent uh, manager or coach. And his name was uh, Dave Brailsford. Uh, and he put in place a whole lot of training programs or, or initiatives uh, that eventually led to Britain becoming the top cycling team in the world. And you can see in 2008, um, they took 12 medals of which seven were gold. And they've been the number one cycling team ever since. And he put in place this concept called marginal gains. Uh, and the principle behind this is that if you break, broke down everything you could think of that goes into riding a bicycle and you improve each one by 1%, you'll get a significant increase when you put them all together. And that's quite correct. You can see the impact the marginal gains philosophy had on the British cycling team outcome. And uh, I'm saying the same thing about MS. If we break down everything that goes into improving MS outcomes and improve it by 1%, we'll get a significant increase when we put them all together. And so that's why we have to go beyond simply targeting relapses and focal inflammatory lesions on MRI scan. We've got to think beyond that. We've got to start focusing on those things that are driving smoldering MS. Can we clear the brain of B cells, plasma cells? Can we stop those slowly expanding lesions getting larger? Can we switch off those microglia? Can we improve or flatten neurofilament levels, which are a marker of damage? Um, and at the same time, you know, can we actually build a sandwich where we take people who've got MS, give them neuroprotective drugs, remyelinate the damaged axons and restore function by promoting recovery of function? Okay, and I've already pointed out that we potentially need to still optimize anti-inflammatories. We, we can show that despite people being free of relapses and MRI activity, if you go up with the dose, we may be able to, uh, for example, ocrelizumab, we may be able to have better outcomes as well. And then obviously focusing on brain health. So this is why I'm pushing the so-called holistic management of MS. We need to think broadly and not just as MS clinicians, just focus on you know, building this pyramid, but we also need to focus on all the other things. And I put I put here uh, rehabilitation and prehabilitation because rehabilitation is usually in response to damage, okay? Whereas prehabilitation is before you get damaged. And I think um, we should be having people participating actively in prehabilitation programs um, as part of brain health. You know, how do we get people to exercise and stay exercising? How do we get people to adopt a healthy lifestyle and continue to adopt a healthy life? These are all really uh, important issues, and we can't just do this passively and tell people to do this. We have to have uh, programs based on behavioral psychology that nudges people to continue to do this. Otherwise, the uh, dropout rate from exercise and dietary programs is so high that uh, you know giving advice would be wasting time. We really do need to combine it with a proactive approach. And this is what we're trying to do. So this is uh, a bell curve just showing you that very few patients now with MS get to old age with a healthy brain. Okay, very few patients, in particularly natural history. And with our therapies, we're trying to shift people from the left to the right, in other words, improve outcomes. And hopefully in the future, when we have combination therapies and holistic uh, management of MS, in other words, marginal gains, you know, we'll get the majority of people uh, with MS to old age with a healthy brain so that they can age normally. I mean, isn't that an, not an unrealistic expectation if you have MS to try and get to old age with a healthy brain? And uh, I want to show you another disease area. Uh, this is a publication where when I read it, it stuck in my brain. This is uh, the 200th anniversary edition of the New England Journal of Medicine that I've been reading for since I was in medical school. Uh, and you, this is looking at deaths per 100,000 population of cardiovascular disease. And you can see in the 1950s, it was about 450. Uh, and then they introduced uh, coronary artery bypass grafts. And they introduced statins and they introduced things called angioplasty. Each little one itself is not a big change, 
But when you look at the, when you add up all these, the change is remarkable. They've improved outcomes, reduced mortality by a factor of three or more by small marginal gains. And I'm hoping that in 10, 15, 20 years, I could show you the same curve for MS, that with each little innovation, we're improving outcomes. So by the end, we left with a, a much better outcome on average uh, compared to what MS used to do in the past. And so this is the this is an example from another disease area of what I'm hoping we are, we're going to be able to do in MS. So to conclude then, um, I hope I've made you realize that inactive MS is a misnomer. MS is rarely inactive. The real MS is not just relapses and MRI activity, but rather smoldering MS. We now know that we have to go beyond targeting just inflammation and target smoldering processes to reduce end organ damage. We have a lot of drivers, processes that we need to target, and I don't think one is going to you know, be the holy grail. We're probably going to have to have multiple therapies to target different processes. And clearly this has implications for how we do clinical trials and how we do outcomes, etc., cetera, in, in the future. Okay. Um, and obviously there's more to treating MS than tackling MS-specific mechanisms only. We obviously have to uh, fo have foster adoption of therapeutic strategies. So if you have enjoyed this, please uh, share it with um, your colleagues and ask any questions and I'll try and respond to them. Thank you.